everyone and welcome. Sorry for the false start or whatever you want to call it here. Yeah, when John asked me to share this morning, I didn't I, I really didn't try to find the most controversial subject I could think of. It was really something that God brought to me in our discussion last Sunday. But you might you might think that, I don't know. But what I'd like to talk about is the and it's probably not so much of a what you would think of as as a message or a sermon, but maybe more of a topic. But we don't have those so often, so that's what I felt led to share. I like to talk about the history of English Bible translations. We've we've talked about this some a little bit here, and but I think there's a lot that we can learn, and that we should learn, and I think there's also a lot of just false information that's out about. Bible translations, there's lots of rhetoric about it, there's lots of ideas and opinions and very strong opinions. Thank you. And so I would like to hopefully cut through to some of that and look at what, what really is the truth about it. And I don't think this is going to be something that we do all in one all at one time, all in one Sunday morning, So, uh, but we'll get started. I think probably this morning we'll talk through, we'll study through the history, probably up till and including the King James Bible, and then maybe at some other point we'll, we'll look at some of the other versions since then, and some of the, 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 what is the truth about them, and what we can do about it, and how we should decide what we should do, what we should be using. So that's, that's what I'd like to look about this morning. I'd like to start with a question. Do, do, do our Bible translations really matter? What, what are your thoughts? Does it, is it, does it matter or is it just a, a lot of ado about nothing? Do, should we just, does it, does it really matter? And why, Art? Why does it matter? Uh, some, some translations, I understand, were, were written with specific intentions, if not dubious intentions. But I don't know which ones they are. <laughs> so Art thinks there were some there were some Bible translations that were made with 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 bad motives, uh, but he doesn't know which ones they are. So maybe we could have anyone else have any more thoughts? Well, what's interesting is we have a tendency to think the King James is the best, but I've also heard that very thing. The King he had specific ideas about say the Roman Catholic religion at that time influenced the translation to read how he wanted it to read. So we're going to get into that, but let, let's... Things that I've heard now, well, you know, why is it we, we are so, you know, wound up so, so, yes, we'll, we'll get to that point, but I guess my question is why? Why does it matter? We say it's important, but why? Well, I think it's important that it's accurate and that it's the that's word true. of God that's unchanged and unadulterated. From what I understand, the, the gay movement right now is writing their own version of the Bible, taking out all of the verses that relate to homosexuality. Mm -hmm. so if, our, if our children are growing up and come in contact with that version, 30 years down the road from now, they can look through it and say, well, homosexuality isn't wrong because the Bible doesn't say anything about it. And it's because of the polluted version. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the crux of the matter. We pattern our lives after that. And I think we need to be spirit-led, and that will give us guidance. But we also need to, to, as we try the spirits, as we're Bereans and we search the scriptures, if we're searching the scriptures and they're not reality, that won't work. And so I think that's the key. I, I, our Ukrainian friends, yes? Just uh, consistency. There's a question, is it important that we all memorize and use the same thing? I think logistically it helps as far as how the flow of con uh, context and, and so on. But I'm not, uh, I don't feel like you should make a doctrine. Mm -hmm. One thing, uh, just as an example, and there are some of these, our Ukrainian friends aren't here this morning, but in their Ukrainian Bible, it says that it talks about the Christian woman's veiling. It says a wife is to cover her head. 
Now that word that's translated it could be translated woman or wife. It's you know it's not, but it influences their practice. And so when they get married, they their women wear a veiling, and it affects our practice. And to me, that one I would say is probably not extremely important, and we shouldn't you know. But it does it does matter. I would just say real quickly right now that those differences between the versions very very seldom do affect what we believe. But I think it is important to, to, uh, to study a Bible that, that is true. Yes? I just have to think when one of the brethren said that the Babia Berean, what scriptures did they search? We're or, trying we're, to find out what scripture they used. Then we, oh, we quoted so gladly, well, the Bereans, we need to be Bereans. Okay, so what scripture did they search? Well, it was a translation. It wasn't the original. Yeah, I can tell you right. that at least. But <laughs> maybe that will get us in first base. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to get to that too. I would like to say before I get started, I have a couple biases coming in. Hopefully, I, I'm trying to be as objective as possible, but I do have a few biases, so hopefully, they don't shine through too much. Uh, I would say we're going to study a little bit about Tyndale. I agree with him in that uh, we should use Bible that is simple and plain and easy to understand. I also tend to oppose a more centralized, top-down control of church, and I would be more inclined to appreciate a spirit-controlled, more collaborative approach to church, spirit-controlled individuals. So that, those are my, my biases I bring to the table. So let's talk about where our Bible comes from. Where is the beginning? When, what, what did, how did Adam write down what happened in the creation? Does anybody know? Or maybe Abel or Seth or Well they didn't. And until about the time of Moses, there was no such thing as written Hebrew. Some people even think Moses invented the Hebrew system of writing. I'm not too sure about that. But either way, it was orally. It was all transmitted just by mouth for thousands of years. And 3200 BC is when we find about roughly the first writing. It wasn't the Hebrew, it was cuneiform, it would have been the Sumerians that were nearby. Then we had the Egyptians, and then Hebrew. And we have God wrote on the tablets. There's not a lot of record as to exactly what he wrote, but apparently it was Hebrew. This was, uh, it was one of the first phonetic alphabets. Instead of having you know, pictures like the Egyptians would have had, there was letters for each sound was written right to left as opposed to left to right. Needless to say, there's nothing left from that period. We don't, we don't have anything around from that time. The first translation was what's called the Septuagint. And you talked about the Bereans searching the scriptures. Very, very likely that's what they would have used. That translation began around the 3rd century BC. And it was translating it from Hebrew and Aramaic into, into Greek so that the Jews scattered around the, the Roman and Greek world could read the Bible if they didn't know, if they didn't know um, Hebrew and Aramaic, which is a similar. It was translated in Alexandria in Egypt. The story goes, uh, it's probably not exactly true, that they had these 72 men all individually translated it and came out with exactly identical translations. I think that would be a translator's dream, but I don't think that's really how it goes. We'll see more of that as we study the history of it. Uh, it was sort of it, it was, it was sort of a partial translation at first. Eventually, eventually it inclu included the Apocrypha, which are those books between the Testaments that we don't tend to include in our Bibles now. Any time that there are quotes from the Old Testament in the New Testament, that's what they were generally quoting, and that's why sometimes you'll see that it's a, the wording's a little bit different in the New Testament than what it was in the Old Testament because they were quoting from a translation and not the original, so it didn't always line up exactly. But this is what you know the New Testament Christians would have largely been using. Next we go to Christian early Christian writings, and we have the apostles were writing. There were there was lots of, there were lots of writings at around that time. They went to books instead of scrolls. They were a little easier to carry, a little easier to look instead of having to scroll all the way through the scrolls. The Old Testament were, was written on scrolls because for what, at least one reason was they weren't allowed to touch it. It was too sacred, so they had to use it by the handles instead of touch the paper. 
And for a while, the Romans tried to destroy these writings. They tried to get rid of them because they were, they were against Christianity and they wanted to destroy all their writings, help disconnect them. But that all changed when Constantine became emperor and suddenly Christianity was the religion of the empire. He actually commissioned some books to be printed, about 50 Bibles. That's what this is, the Codus Vaticanus. That's what he would have printed. He printed about 50 of those. The next step in this progression is the Latin Vulgate. And this is what, you know, even today is sort of the traditional Bible of the Roman Catholic Church as the church of the Roman Empire became what we know as, as the Roman Catholic Church. Latin would have been the language that they used. So St. Jerome translated that. And he also standardized or was, by the time he translated, the, the books were fairly standardized as to what was to be included in the New Testament. He started by translating the Gospels, then he did all the New Testament, and eventually he translated the entire Bible, the Old Testament as well, into Greek. And throughout the Dark Ages, this was the text that was the only text. It's what everyone used, at least in the Roman Catholic Church. And a lot of the Protestants considered it to be somewhat corrupt, not totally accurate. As I would see it, it probably wasn't deliberately so. I, th I think he tried to make a good translation, but it, it, do it definitely does lean in towards the, the Catholic interpretation of Scripture, be sh for sure, because translations do require interpretation. You have to understand what it means in order to translate it, and if he had that understanding, that's how he would have translated it. Also was the first version to have chapter divisions, so that you could actually, you know, these, these were just letters that had been written. So uh, Steve Langdon, who also, coincidentally drafted the Magna Carta just for interest's sake. He divided it into chapters so you could look through it, you could understand it, you could study it better. Next, as we're coming into the Reformation period, this man by the name of Erasmus, he said, this Latin Vulgate is not so great, uh, so let's, let's, let's improve it. <clears throat> so he went and assembled a Greek text in the Greek language so that in order to to compare it to the Latin Vulgate and he assembled this together it was kind of in a hurry because he was trying to beat someone else to get it done but and so it was full of errors and and it, and it was it was not very consistent with the Vulgate if you, so he printed them side by side and you could tell there were differences and so he he carefully introduced a few changes into the Vulgate kind of risked his reputation with the Catholic Church to do that, although some places he changed the Greek to match the Vulgate too, so he, he, he tried to do a good job. It came out with a lot of errors and there were a lot of problems, but he kept revising and each time he'd, he'd tweak the Vulgate a little more until, until he had a, a pretty good Greek text, the original text to, to translate from. By the third edition, it, it was pretty good. It was pretty accurate and all the translations of that era came from this text. Luther, Tyndale, many more would have used this Greek. You know, he, he got it together and said, all right, by that time they had been copied many, many times, so he had to compare them together and say, what, 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 what did the original writers say? And so he assembled that. And it's basically what we call today the received text or the textus receptus. You might have heard of that. It's what the King James was translated from. Now I'd like to look a little bit at canonization, or, or what we, we'd say, deciding what books fit in the Bible. This is a summary of some of the books that were considered or made it into some Bibles. It's quite a few more. This is just the New Testament. In the Old Testament, there wasn't as much disagreement, although the Apocrypha was one thing that was in and out, mostly in during this time period. And... By the, at first, there were about 20 books in the New Testament that everyone pretty much agreed on. There were some other ones that were a little more debated, or quite a few. Some were almost made it in. The Shepherd of Hermas was one that very nearly made it in. The Gospel of Mary, another one that was questionable. The Book of James, actually, was, was very questionable. Some people didn't, th didn't think it should be. But eventually, they came up with a group of rules that say, this is what, it, what a book has to be what the writer has to be in order to, to fit in. And by the year 367, they had compiled a list that was pretty, pretty solid and what Jerome's translation was based on. Although 
um, the Eastern Church, like the, the so we had the Catholic Church in the West and the Eastern part of the Empire, the Byzantine Empire. They did not agree, but with with this list, and they I think even to this day have have a little bit different a little bit different books in the New Testament. Also, the 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 Apocrypha. We'll talk about that a little bit later. That got dropped, not so much because of opposition to it, but more because people just weren't reading it. So that was sort of a printer's decision. So that, now I'm done with the introduction. Now we'll talk about translation a little bit more. So if we, if we look, if we divide the history of English Bible translation, you can, basically it's before the King James Version and after the King James Version. It's, it's the most influential version. It's sometimes called the authorized version. The first English Bible was translated by this man, John Wycliffe. It was translated into Middle English and you can kind of understand why we don't use that anymore. It's, it's almost impossible to get much meaning out of that. It was very, very early. It was in the 1300s. It also, I mean, he, he made an, an excellent effort to translate it, but it was translated from the Latin Vulgate, so it wasn't from original languages, so it had a lot of inaccuracies. There was also some disagreement as to whether how literal it should be, and this disagreement hasn't gone away even to today after he died his secretary who had helped him redid it and made it less literal and more easy to read so th this this argument is not at all new it was not widely published partly probably because it was illegal you could be killed if you were caught with this bible and also because it had to be hand copied it was before the printing press so it took two man years of labor to copy the bible so it and it didn't really, it was sort of all by itself, it didn't really have a lot of influence on later Bibles. This was this is one that's kind of all by itself. Probably next to the King James Bible, we think of William Tyndale. He was inspired by Martin Luther. There's a possibility he actually studied under Martin Luther. We don't know for sure. And he said, when he heard about the the Luther translation, he went to the Bishop of Canterbury, the Archbishop, and said, we need to have this in English. And uh, he was not granted permission. This was before that would have been allowed. So he moved to Europe to work on that, to get it printed. And he completed the New Testament in 1525. He started on translating the Old Testament, but he wasn't able to get finished. It wasn't of course, like I said, it wasn't the first English translation, but it was the first one from the original languages. He did a very, very thorough job, and and he he did it from Erasmus's received text was where he so it was it was accurate. It was it was just a a good translation. He made it. He printed it in a small form factor. It was easy to smuggle in. It was easy to carry with you. One of his sort of guiding principles was he wanted it to be simple enough that the plowboy could read it while he was plowing and that the common people could, could understand the Bible, have it in their own language. They printed it in Europe, smuggled it in, and it had pretty wide distribution. It was also one of the first, I think it was the first English Bible to be printed in by a printing press so they could make a lot of them and get them, get them imported. The Catholics did not like this Bible. They felt like he had deliberately mistranslated it to strike down their doctrines. He was definitely anti-Catholic, but I don't think there was deliberateness in that. He tried to be true to, to what it really said. Here's just a few pictures of copies of it, or, or actually I think these are originals. It's a page from the book of John. It is definitely more like English we speak today, but it's still still a pretty far cry from from what we would speak and read. He was martyred for his translation before I think it was before it was even around the time it was published, a little before I think. And his prayer was, "Lord, open the King of England's eyes." And God definitely answered that prayer. Not long after that, the King James Version, which was authorized by King James used about 80 to 90 percent of his translation so it's it's very similar it was just building on his work but he wasn't able to finish the old testament either it also opened the floodgates of demand for an english bible even though it wasn't allowed it, it the demand was that much that it did push push the church and the king to to allow it next we have the great bible and this was authorized. It was before the King James Version. And if you look, here's the title page. And this will give you a, a, a concept of what the, the culture was like. So here at the top is the king. 
and he's handing the Bible out to his, to his royalty, to the bishops, and they're slowly handing it down until they get to the bottom where the common people can finally have the Bible. And just, and, and you know, if you think, oh, where's God in this? Well, they, these people, the common people are saying, God save the king. So that's how much credit, that's how they looked at, um, at who was in charge. So God gets to be way at the bottom in a casual mention, the kings at the top, the bishops, the, the nobles. It's a little bit how, how things were there. There was also a couple other Bibles. There was kind of a, a number of close revisions sort of close together. The Coverdale Bible, the Matthew Bible. And this was in 1539. So not at all long after, after Tyndale's Bible. And this was the very first authorized Bible in, in England. It was prepared by Miles Coverdale. Lord Cromwell had commissioned it under King Henry VIII. And this was very much based on the Tyndale Bible. It was... And they added the, uh, the remaining books that he hadn't finished translating from the Old Testament. Although they, and they did kind of take out some parts that were a bit objectionable to the king and the church, especially the, the footnotes, kind of the explanations. Here's why it's translated this way, because they're moving from another Bible. And so there was a lot of explanation in there, and, and they didn't like much of that, so they got rid of the footnotes. Also, it was the first one to separate the Apocrypha from the Old Testament. So here's the Old Testament, the Apocrypha, and the New Testament. The next Bible we'd like to look at is the Geneva Bible, a very different Bible. This was a group of Puritans who fled to Geneva in Switzerland because they were being persecuted by Mary Tudor, who was a Catholic. It was an excellent translation. It was very scholarly. These people understand, understood the original languages. They were, they were very well-versed. It was also the first English Bible to include verse, the verses for looking things up. And King James, before he was king of England, he was first king of Scotland. And he actually authorized the publishing of this Bible, although I'm not sure why, because he had some serious problems with this Bible. The, mainly, again, the footnotes. These Puritans were adamantly anti-king and anti-established church. And all through the footnotes, they were downing the king and... The, if you, uh, the, the midwives in, under Pharaoh, that well, Pharaoh said, kill all the baby boys, and, but they disobeyed and they didn't do that. And they, they just saluted these, these midwives for the disobedience. King James said, absolutely, we can't have disobedience to the king. I'm accountable to God. Well, I don't know about that, but he said he was. And then everybody must be, obey me unconditionally in every case, no matter what. The other thing is, anywhere that the Bible had the word king, they translated it tyrant. So they didn't exactly endear their translation to King James. There's another page from, the, from that. This was the Bible that the pilgrims would have brought to America, the pilgrims in the Plymouth Plantation. And it was the Bible that Shakespeare would have read. It was, it was, it was pretty popular for being banned, again. But it, it, did, it did get pretty wide distribution because it was such a good translation this is the bishop's bible and the next kind of the next step along the way published by queen elizabeth also again at that point the official bible of the church of england all the footnotes are gone we don't have any of those because we can't have that and it was it was a massive bible both physically and, and sort of in its in its reading it was just very pompous and and just difficult to read for instance, where the King James says, cast thy bread upon the waters, this version would say, it said, lay thy bread upon wet faces. It just was, it did, was not very meaningful, but just, it sounded great. Anyway, it had 124 full page illustrations. <clears throat> it was a pulpit Bible. It would be chained to the pulpits of the church so they could use it. And it was really barely easier to read than the Latin Bible. So it wasn't, it wasn't a great Bible for, for reading. And if you can, here's a, the cover page of that one. It's kind of the same thing. The queen's at the top and everybody else around it. Way down here, God gets his name. God saved the queen. So that's a little bit where that one was. Next, we have the King James Version. This is the most significant translation probably of any book anywhere of all time. More influential. It's just, it is... It's the foundation of, of English church in many, many, many ways. Yes? Um, 
uh, perhaps at this juncture you should differentiate between translation and what are the other options? Summer. We'll, we'll get there. Okay. That's the next time. I don't think we're going to get there this morning, okay. but we will get there. <laughs> So, King James himself, here's a picture of him as a child. He had a terrible childhood. His mother was killed. (laughs) His mother was killed, the queen, and he was kidnapped. He was raised by brutal tutors. They beat him. It 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 was really bad. And... He was, a, he, was a, he was an interesting man. He enjoyed hunting. He had an unusual fondness for men and boys, so there was quite a bit of scandal around that. He sometimes neglected his government instead and instead enjoyed pleasure and hunting and doing whatever he wanted to do. He was pretty financially irresponsible. At the end of his life, he became a heavy drinker, so he wasn't a man of great character. Although he was, he had a lot of good qualities. He was the master of compromise and politics the great uniter he brought together religious differences initially he was he was pretty popular he didn't he had a peaceful ascent to power he wasn't there wasn't a fight about it and he tried to bring together the anglicans the puritans and the catholics or at least the anglicans and the puritans and which was a pretty difficult task and though he was a protestant he promised that he would not persecute the catholics as long as they at least obeyed him out of fear said uh, i won't persecute you just because you're catholic as long as you obey so you know he was maybe a step better than some of the some of the ones before him he was first monarch of scotland he was the first effective monarch scotland had had in a very long time and then he became king of both england and scotland he was very very intelligent and he was a confident theologian he believed he understood Bible and and he actually started translating the Psalms by himself before the King James Version began. But he believed he reigned by divine right. God had appointed him and he had all the pomp and ceremony of a stereotypical king that you would think of. And yeah, the absolute obedience to him, no questions asked. He even wanted to be called a god. Uh, And he was also, but in some ways, you know, with that pride, he, he, he knew how to get people to follow him yeah. he, he would flatter them and so he had a lot of a lot of people following him as far as in the church he had kind of taken the place of the pope they had king and england had back back forth between catholicism and the anglican church protestantism and and he basically said enough with catholicism i'm going to be the pope instead he didn't say that but that's effectively what he did and I'd like to look a little bit at kind of the religious and political background in England at that time. It's, I don't think we can quite fully imagine how things worked back then. They had been Catholic and then Protestant and then Catholic and one gets persecuted and the other one's run away and then, they, then it's the other way around. And, and the, how intertwined church and state and everyday life were is I think beyond our imagination as Americans. It was all the same thing. It just unbelievably intertwined. Mary Tudor, who was a Catholic, who had been before him, had kind of tried to be a moderate Catholic, although she sure persecuted the Protestants, but she had kind of taken a little bit of a middle road, and that's a little bit where the Anglican Church is today, kind of halfway between Protestant and Catholic, if you're, if you're familiar with that at all. They left behind some of the ceremony and pomp of the Catholic Church, but they still, they still embrace some things, transubstantiation, and in other words, the belief that communion is the actual, literal body and blood of Jesus. They left that behind. But looking at it today, it still looks very Catholic to us. So we have James trying to unite these factions together. The Anglicans believed the kings and the bishop. The king and the bishops were the head of the church. The Puritans said, no way. And they were, they were against the king, and they wanted a very strict interpretation and a strict translation of the Bible. So that's what they wanted. They had their Geneva Bible, which I would say was a very good translation, but it was not allowed. And the Catholics at this point were just hoping that they wouldn't be persecuted, which thankfully they weren't. They also, there was a strong belief that going back to classical wisdom, reading the Greeks, reading the Romans, 
was, was the way to find knowledge. They were not about innovation. They were about going back and discovering old knowledge. And this carried over into the Bible. They studied a lot of ancient texts, not just the Bible, but they were, they were very much going back, like saying, what did these people have back then? They're coming out of the Dark Ages. They said, we obviously don't have it figured out. The Romans and the Greeks did. Let's, let's figure out what they had. And then religiously, the Bible as well. An ideal scholar in that day would have known Greek, Hebrew, and Latin, so you could study all these old texts. So at this time, creating a new Bible or translating a new version of the Bible as a compromise was, was political genius, and that's really what he was doing. So there's a lot of pressure on him kind of from all sides to, to bring this together, to figure it out. It was, it was a, throughout Europe, all the other kings couldn't do it. There were civil wars all over the place about this. And, and he, he said, let's do something about this. So they got, they brought at, here at this Hampton Court, they had a conference in 1604 they said let's figure this out and he called together lots of different people he called together some puritans a very small delegation of puritans wearing their plain garb you know if you imagine the the, the pilgrims that's, that's sort of how it was their black hats black clothes black shoes with belt buckles all over and then they had the bishops with their silks and just crazy fancy dress were there as well mocking the they're waiting to get in the, they're mocking the pilgrims you know this is tension all over the place. And this man, Richard Bancroft, he was the Bishop of London. He was soon to be appointed the Bishop, the Archbishop of Canterbury, so like over the entire church. Not exactly a man of great character, another politician and yeah, quite a, quite a man. He was not happy about this conference. He said, we want, I, I, he wants Conformity in the church, not compromise. He wanted the church to be the church. He didn't like the idea of a new Bible. He didn't like this conference, and but he was put in charge of the conference, and then later partly in charge of the translation, and he ran it to be the way he wanted it to be. This man, Lancelot Andrews, he was one of the greatest linguists in all of England. He knew languages extremely well, also very, very corrupt. He was handpicked to take the side of the church in this argument. And he was also in char later in charge of the group that translated the Bible at, the, at Westminster Abbey, the committee there. John Reynolds, this was, he was the man in charge of the Puritan delegation. He was president of the Corpus Christi College. And he was a moderate, so they decided it was okay to bring him in to represent the Puritans because he, he wasn't too, too crazy on the Puritan side. Extremely knowledgeable very, very educated in Hebrew. And he was very, very energetic and passionate. Like he put his all into everything. During the translation, he was sick a lot of the time, he, but he made it to the meetings. Eventually he couldn't walk anymore. So they carried his bed to the meetings. He, he just put everything he had into the translation and he actually died before it was finished. But he was, so he was the very, very, um, a very, very important part of this meeting. So we kind of have these two, these two sides, or at least two sides coming in here, and there was just, the tension is great, and we have in great pomp King James under his canopy. Everyone who wants to address him must kneel before him. So you can kind of get the feeling that this must have been. And the king, all the top brass of the church, the bishops and everybody are there, his courtiers, it's just amazing. So King James opened with a, with a great flowery political speech. He says he wants to keep continuity with the past. He doesn't want to change too much. And uh, you know, he just, let's, let's just keep everything flowing smoothly. Well, that didn't last long. But anyway, they had on the agenda three things. Proper provision for the pastors in Ireland, whether ecclesiastical courts can excommunicate people, and there were some objections to reading the Bible in church. So those were the three things. The first day, the Puritans weren't even allowed in. They just had the, the, the bishops were there. And then the second day, the Puritans were allowed in. And the debate was quite lively, very rude. They were insulting each other. It was because they were just miles apart. John Reynolds, this Puritan man, he really angered the king by some things he said. And so he decided, oh, we're going to have to try it. We're going to have to change tactics. So he said, what we really need is a new Bible. And... Of course, he meant, let's have the Geneva Bible instead of the Bishop's Bible. But King James, the politician that he was, he's like, that's actually a great idea. Let's have a new Bible. We're going to translate a brand new Bible. 
well, that wasn't really what he had in mind, but they were, they, uh, they eventually did decide to have a compromise translation with Puritans and Anglicans on the committee. And it's interesting that the whole King James translation is basically sort of a coincidence of debate. It was not the main point of this meeting. It kind of came out as a compromise. And the thing I take away from that is, in the midst of all this ungodliness, if you will, God brought something out of that that was a blessing to the church for many, many years. And so you, know, you look at God's in control. And so that, that I, found, I find encouraging. I mean, you look at the process, how they decided to do it, how they translated it, and it's full of corruption and it's, it's a wreck. But God worked it out. So I, th- I, think, I think we should remember that. Third day, they went on to discuss other things. And so it's just kind of just for, for a bit, they talked about this and decided, King James said, yep, let's have a new Bible. And they moved on to other things. The official record says that all the members of the meeting promised to be quiet and obedient. The, fi- the king's final speech brought tears to the eyes of those on both sides. The king was happy with the outcome. The Puritans were happy with the outcome. They got a new Bible, although it turns out they weren't too happy with it as it turned out. But they were happy at that point. because. Uh, but Rich- Richard Bancroft, the man partially in charge of the translation, made so many rules about how it was to be translated that they couldn't really do it the way they wanted. But they left the meeting happy at least. And the translation began. This man, an incredibly corrupt man, was put in charge of it. He was then the Secretary of State. He, England was at war with Spain at this time. This man was receiving incredibly large bribes from Spain all the time to do what they wanted him to do. But he's in charge of the translation. So it's, and then under him was Richard Bancroft, the man we talked about before. He wrote up these rules. But they made an incredibly structured approach to this. They had 54 people, the most well-educated people in all of England. Interestingly enough, about half of them were Puritans because they were the, the most scholarly people in England that they could find. And they had three committees for the Old Testament, two for the New Testament, and one for the Apocrypha. So they split that up and then they would translate these individually. Well, I'll, I'll go through the process a little bit more. These committees were dispersed across England. They had one in London at the Westminster Abbey, University of Cambridge, and the University of Oxford. And they each would take their sections and translate it. Richard Bancroft had these rules that they had to obey. Here's a few of them. They were to use older translations. It wasn't a a brand new translation. They were just to, it was more of a revision than it was a brand new translation. Like I said, it was 80 or 90 percent was Tyndale's work. They also were to, the, the ones that they were to use were the Bishop's Bible, which was to be the, the basis, which all the Puritans hated. They were to start with that, but they were to compare the Tyndale Bible and the Geneva Bible. They were not to make any radical changes. They were to use traditional church language, not congregational. So in other words, they were to use the language of the Anglican church and not the, the more Puritan style of worship. They were to always use the word baptize instead of wash. They were always to use the word bishop instead of elder. So it was, they, they had a lot of rules about how they, were to, how they were to translate this. The process was extremely scrupulous. They were, they were determined to do a thorough, a well-done job, more than any other translation before, and right up there with some of the ones since it as well. The process was for them to take the bishop's Bible home, each person, not each committee, but each person would take it home and read it. They would make their revisions to it. They would bring it back to their committee. They would review it and come up with another version, and then they would take their version to the the, the committee in London for final approval and, and sort of mesh them all together. All throughout this process, it was all verbal. There was not more than one copy there. One person would read it out. This was to be a Bible that was read in the church, and so they did not want this to be a reader's Bible, but a, ver- for, a verbal for people to hear it. So, so how did it sound? That was, that was what was the, the goal of having a, of this translation. Also interesting, they, they very much saw themselves as making a good version better, and they also would have seen themselves also as part of a long line of revisions. There were some before, there will be some after. And, and I think that goes against what some people would say today, that you know, it's got it's to be frozen in time. And 
they, you know, this was, and there were no numerous corrections and modernizations since then too, some of which we use today. So in 1611, it was published and it was, had a number of mistakes, printing mistakes, you know, when you're looking at backwards letters on your printing press and sticking them in there all in the right order, one letter at a time, it, it's difficult. So they, so the first editions had quite a few mistakes. One of the most famous was what was known as the Wicked Bible. That one was was it's still a famous version you can have today. Exodus 20, thou shalt commit adultery. But there was the Great He Bible, there was the She Bible, one called Ruth He instead of She, and then so those were and interesting today the NIV actually says He again because they think that actually was the right way first of all. But it's an interesting side note. I like to look at the strengths of it. It was. In many, many ways, it was by far the best translation so far. It has the, it, it, it's, it's beautiful flowery language. It, you know, if you think of a, of a Shakespeare play, it was kind of in that style to, to be very grand, to be as a, as a preacher would stand up on his great pulpit and read it out to the people. But yet it's simple. It's easier to under, it's easy, relatively easy to understand, especially in that day. It had fairly classic language. It was very strict, very scholarly, and fairly literal. Although they did try to, you know, try to, to bring the both the meaning and the, the the words. It was also very much influenced by the original languages it came from. They tried to be very literal, so word order was not necessarily as natural as you might think. It was if there was a word order in the original, they would keep it as long as it made sense. In, in the modern. And so it wasn't necessarily, you know, we think of maybe King James spoke exactly like that. Well, not necessarily. It was somewhat that way, but not totally. And it very much also influenced the English language. The English language moved towards this language. There were some problems, though, and some that we're still facing. There were definitely some changes to justify Anglican tradition. Just for an example, so 1 Corinthians 13 uses the word charity. They considered using the word love. There's actually an original copy where of the, of the Bishop's Bible where, where one of the editors was caught and he crossed out that and he wrote love. So we don't really know a lot about the process, why they chose it, but if you think of a great wealthy bishop giving charity to the poor people outside his door, that was acceptable to the Anglicans. If you think of the Puritans and the Anglicans having to actually love each other, that's a much more difficult thing. And so they did tend, there were some things that, well, it was, it was very accurate generally. They, were, they, they definitely leaned in the, in the direction of, of, what they, of what they believed then. We talked, Art said, about motives. The motives were terrible. It was almost all politics. The Greek and the Hebrew manuscripts that they used were left somewhat to be desired. They were the very best they had available at the time, but since then there have been a lot of older and more accurate man manuscripts discovered. The, the received text that they used it was somewhat influenced by the Latin Vulgate, um, so that, that's, that was not ideal, but it was, it was, it was reasonably good. The English is, is outdated today. This is not a problem so much then, but now. So, and, and we probably largely have, have learned to deal with this, but think of this just, if you would say, uh, say James 5.11, the Lord is pitiful. Right. What would that mean to you? Do you understand that? I think we probably do mostly, but it's a problem. And even at the time of translation, the language was a bit archaic because like I said, they, they brought some of that word order and so forth from the from the from the originals and to me this is this is this is a, a personal experience to me to me what i see as the biggest issue is it separates my daily life from my religious life and this is something i did not know happened until i began reading in a little bit more modern translation we, we changed family devotions and as a family we changed to, to a more modern version and we did it we, we didn't want to do it because we had memorized and we talked about the consistency and, and, you know, working together with other people. We didn't want to do it because of that, but we felt like in order for our children, it would be a good thing to do that so that they could understand it more deeply. But what I never expected to happen was how much it affected me. When I read it in the language I speak, as opposed to a different language, it affects me differently. 
because I realize this is what I'm to be doing every day, not while I'm at church, not just while I'm at church. And if you think about the struggles of some of the Amish and Mennonites 100, 150 years ago, moving from the German Bible to the English Bible that they speak every day, that I feel is kind of what happened to me. The argument can be made. We know German. We teach our children German. But it, it creates a wall, at least it did for me, that here is when I'm reading the Bible and here's my everyday life, and those two don't cross over enough. And that is really what I found made the difference for me. So I think that's something we should consider. Sometime later, we're going to probably talk about and, and say, what, how, what should we be doing? And, and I'll, pr I'll probably look into you for, for more input. This is kind of a history lecture. I would like to, to hear your input. I, as I said, I have some biases around this subject. So I would like to hear from you. And I need to also do some more study about the, the plethora. I think there's right around 400 English translations. There are far fewer, you know, maybe 20 or so that are really viable translations. <clears throat> all reasonably good and I'd like to look at those and hear your input about those and and study those a little bit but um, this gives you the background I said it kind of divides to before and after the King James I would like to move from here look at that and we'll do that some other time the just a little bit the legacy that the King James Bible has had inter very interestingly enough it was initially opposed by the religious conservatives, the people who, who would defend it today. They said it was not enough like the Geneva Bible. But after over 400, it's been over, it's over 400 years old. It is the most widely published book in the English language. It's the most influential. We have culture and heritage so much. There are all kinds of phrases and, and references to it. You think of the salt of the earth or talents. A talent is a measure of weight, but today we say a talent is a gift or an ability, a skill. And that's all about the parable of the talents. And I think in many ways, the King James parallels Luther's translation in German. It influenced the German language. It unified the language. And many people consider it to be the pinnacle of English literature. For many years, it was the only Bible in many, many homes. Its, its grammar and vocabulary is relatively simple. Its intention was to be, in spoken, was to be spoken. It's influenced all kinds of writers, Christian and secular. It's been the centerpiece of American religious culture. A little bit of just a little more modern history. There's been some updates in the 1700s. There were some corrections, punctuation, and grammar added. Congress even authorized the printing of the King James Bible so they wouldn't have to import it from England. It was the only Bible that Congress ever authorized it to be printed. So it's a little background. I would, I would invite your your input, your criticism, and your thinking and studying, and sometime, maybe soon, we'll... Look at the next half.